Hey guys, Darren here. Ben here. And we have heard a lot of questions around home hubs uh, coming from you all and we got together because um, we have some too to ask each other and hopefully answer for one another. For the next two minutes to help you to understand all the answers to those questions and then some. Yeah. So take a look, here you go. So what is a home hub? I'm glad you asked, Darren. A home hub is this place of intimate relationship and community. One that refines each other in the desert and in the plentiful lands of the promised land. A place in which we just get to gather together on a weekly basis and be able to, to be sanctified in the Holy Spirit in ways in which we've never experienced. Ben, it, I think you've been a pastor for way too long. It sounds like you're talking about small groups. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I... Thank you. It's it's a small group. It's a small group that meets in somebody's home on a weekly basis. Darren, so when do these things start? When does a home hub start? Uh, good question, Ben, and I'm glad you asked. Uh, they actually started about a week ago. The first few home hubs have launched, and we're still launching more. Um, just waiting for more people to sign up. That's right. So who's to be part of a home hub? Everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. I mean, it, if you're breathing, we'll take you, right? Like, yeah. Right. We have home hubs currently all over Clark County. Um, we have some in Vancouver, Ridgefield, and Battleground, and that is expanding um, based on you all because we actually want home hubs everywhere that you call home. How do you get involved, Darren? Uh, it's actually really easy. If you can see this video, then there should be a place right down here. Just scroll down your screen right there. and comment. Or maybe right there. I don't know. Or if you need to, 360-771-1855. Just call me right now. Right now. Right now. Call me. Right now. Oh. Oh, that was, good. That was yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah. Hello? It's fine. <laughs> So why are we even doing these home hubs? I'm glad you asked. Because we miss you. During this COVID time, we've only seen you through a screen, and this gives us an opportunity to meet in homes and actually be able to see one another face to face. It's part of who we are. We love being around one another. Uh, SGC is all about our community, and this is an opportunity for us to do that. But there's a resilience that we need to have for the future. I don't know. I'm thinking that this may not be the only pandemic it's the zombie apocalypse, for sure. It's on the radar. Oh, I think so. I think it's about time the living dead is going to be here. Yeah, so I don't know about you, Ben, but if that's the case, I don't think I'm going to run to the church to find my, my inner community. Suddenly, coffee doesn't really matter a whole lot, does it? <laughs> and certainly not my preaching. <laughs> but you know what would matter is a group of people that I know that will support me even when my brains are trying to get eaten by the zombies. Okay. So... We hope that you would get involved in a home hub. It's something that is worthwhile to consider because this is where life begins. So, consider it. Make sure you contact this guy. Give him a call. Comment below. We'll get you involved. Talk to you guys later. Welcome to Starting Grounds Church. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors on staff. I am so glad that you've made this part of your week. If you're wanting to know more about Home Hubs beyond what that video had, please contact us. We want to get you connected, particularly in this COVID-19 time where we're hungry and thirsty for, for gathering together. And this is a fun, safe way within the regulations of what government is asking us to do. So please involve yourself, find ways in which you can get in touch. We also want to let you know that our Sunday afternoon 
gathering, which if this is Sunday afternoon and you're watching this, most likely it's Father's Day. So happy Father's Day. But we will be suspending our gathering together and we won't be gathering at two to four at the church, mainly just so we can go and celebrate with our families. But this is, we have a special gift, a special blessing today that we want to share with you. You see, we've always talked about our services being where everyone kind of brings something to the table, an offering, uh, a sharing, something that gives our talents and gifts uh, beyond what the pastors are doing. And we have somebody in our church that has made a video for Father's Day. And so Kyle Davis, thank you for blessing us today. We are excited for what you have innovated and how you invented something. Uh, and so we are excited about seeing that just now. So as we go into this video, Thank you, Kyle, for being somebody who's brought your gifts to the table and allowed us to be blessed by you. So, happy Father's Day. God bless you. Hope you enjoy the service. Okay. Dang it. Hey, Siri. Why won't my engine start? Just, what exactly is the difference between a plus and a minus screwdriver? What is the best way to defrost a freezer? Tell me a joke. How to disconnect a car battery. It's important to learn to disconnect a car battery because if you need to work on your vehicle, you don't want to risk electrocution. Hey Siri, call dad. Hey, I need some help. I have a small tool related issue. My milk is stuck in ice. Um, I'm pretty sure I prefer Siri's joke. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for the help, Dad. Alright. I love you. Bye. Starting Grounds, we are so thankful for you to be with us this morning. We know that as we continue to navigate what life looks like, um, gathering online, gathering virtually, and we begin to um, find more ways to safely gather in person, whether that's um, joining our Sunday afternoon hangouts or joining a home hub, we know that everyone is learning day to day, week to week, what does life look like together now? And we are so thankful for the ways that you've been flexible and the ways that you've participated so far. We encourage you to keep doing that, to keep showing up in the ways that you are able and know that if you need someone to show up for you, let us know. We want to be supportive to you and supportive to one another and knowing that we are built for relationship. Um, and, and one of those relationships we want to highlight today specifically is that relationship of fatherhood. Um, happy Father's Day. Um, we know, kind of like what we talked about with Mother's Day, that, that fatherhood and fathers, and whether that's being a father or looking to your father um, or thinking of God as father, or that parental love, um, that those relationships can be complicated and complex and that maybe you are mourning the loss of a father this year or maybe you have a strained relationship with your father or maybe you didn't have a father growing up um, or maybe you are uh, hanging out with your dad right now. Um, we know that those, those relationships are complex um, and know that we are so thankful for those of you who have... Um, 
embraced that loving fatherhood to either your kids or maybe to someone else's kids or just as a general church father, um, we love you and appreciate you and are thankful for you. And so we want to pray specifically for you this morning. And so let us engage. And maybe if you're with your dad or or you're with your kids right now, um, maybe grab each other's hands or um, put your hand on your dad's shoulder. Or maybe if your dad is has passed or is not with you to kind of just hold your hands out and imagine them with you right now and let us pray with holding that relationship and the forefront of our minds so we pray together lord we look to you um, as the ultimate example of a loving parent we look to you as we think about those in our lives who are fathers or fatherly um, we lift them to you god that as they choose to raise children or they choose to speak into the lives of others and with with wisdom and love and guidance um, and, and and nurturing lord that we are grateful for them and if we are mourning our relationship with our fathers or mourning the loss of a father god we we hold that as well and we hold that to you knowing that you are the ultimate example and that we are always going to be looking to you to lead and guide us the way that our parents and our fathers have guided us in our lives. Um, we ask all of this in your name, that your blessing would be upon all of us, but especially today, the fathers amongst us. Um, we ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. And so as we continue to sing, we sing of God's love that never fails. And so we are grateful for you to be with us this morning. So one, two, three. There's nothing that can separate us from God's love. So we sing together this morning. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away. Your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day, and your love never fails. Through all circumstances, Lord, you stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. rage I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me and your love never fails oh, oh, oh your love never fails through all circumstances no matter what nothing can keep us from God's love Wind is strong and the water's deep. I'm not alone here in these open seas. Cause your love never fails. The chasm is far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. But your love never fails. stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage i don't have to be afraid because i know that you love me your love never fails and your love never fails use all things for the goodness of yourself lord you make all things work together for my good 
you make all things work together for my good for our good together lord you make all things work together for our good you make all things work together for our good you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage i don't have to be afraid because i know that you love me your love never fails oh no your love never fails we thank you lord for your love that never fails us god splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice we sing how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our god in all ages he stands so we sing Age to age he stands And time is in his hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The God had three in one Father, Spirit, Son The Lion and the Lamb How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing it again of God's greatness. How great is our God, sing with me, how great. Our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, aim above all names. You are worthy of all praise, and my heart will sing how great.
There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're all living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Nothing worth more, Lord. There's nothing worth more that nothing could ever more. come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. You undo our shame, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. So make us aware, Lord open our eyes to you. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Happy Sunday, church family. It is wonderful to be with you again this week. It is our third week in our Outrageous series. I am so blessed to be on this journey with you. Last week, we talked about Gideon and how God called him to be a mighty hero 
even when Gideon didn't feel like a hero, even when he thought God might have made a bad choice, God's power worked through him. And I love seeing that God can use even ordinary things and people to do outrageous things. This week we're in the New Testament, the book of Luke, chapter 8, verse 25. While you grab your Bibles and find that verse, I wanted to kind of go over the story a little bit to give you an understanding of where it is set and what it's talking about. So here we find Jesus and his disciples. They're out on the boat and all of a sudden a humongous storm hits and it is scary. They're on a boat and the waves are whipping around, the wind is blowing everything, and they feel really scared. They feel like something bad could happen. They feel like their boat might flip over. They think, oh, we're done, we're doomed. But Jesus is with them. But they kind of forgot that, didn't they? They got really caught up in the fear and in the scary situation. And that was all they saw. They forgot that Jesus was in the very same boat right with them. And once they got Jesus and they actually woke him up, he was sleeping. They went and they woke him up and let him know, oh, we're doomed. There's a huge storm. Help us. And then that's where we pick up here. I'm going to read a couple of verses before our memory verse. Uh, just to give you a little bit of some more to chew on. As they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. And this is verse 23. A storm came down. It was so bad that the boat was about to sink. They were in great danger. The disciples went and woke Jesus up. They said, Master, Master, we're going to drown. The disciple, uh, he got up and ordered the wind and the huge waves by saying one word. Now, what do you think that word is? What do you think? Hmm. That word is stop. And the huge waves stopped. The wind stopped. The storm quieted down and it was completely calm. Where is your faith? Jesus said to the disciples. And now here's our memory verse. They were amazed and full of fear. So have you ever been surprised, but maybe still a little scared? They asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the waves and they obey him. That's pretty interesting to think that even though Jesus was right there in the boat with them, he was one of their closest friends. He was their teacher. They even call him master. He was someone that they listened to and they believed in. And even still in the midst of this storm, they forgot. They forgot all the miracles that they had seen him do, all of the amazing and outrageous things they've been a part of, they forgot their faith. And sometimes we do that too. Sometimes we get caught up in things and we are so busy looking at the situation that we forget who is in control. We forget who we believe in and who we trust in and who we follow. And I love that this story gives us just some comfort to say, you know, that's normal. It happens. We're humans. We make mistakes. But Jesus is right there. He was just as much as he was right in the boat with them. He is in all of our scary situations that we may experience all throughout our life. And I am so encouraged by that, that we know that we can call on him. And with one word, he has the power to calm all the storms of this life. I pray that story encourages you this week. I love you dearly, and I cannot wait to see you again soon. Take care, friends. Bye-bye.
morning. Today we start a new journey called Pursue. My question to you is, is what do you think of when you hear the word pursuit? For some of us, it might be a high-speed chase. Living in LA, I didn't realize this. I thought this was just everyday life, but they somehow have made it an entertainment value. It seemed like on a daily basis, news channels and their choppers were following a high-speed pursuit on the freeways. And there would be people who would cheer on the person trying to get away. And we would watch for hours and hours. It was like they were the Mori Povich of, of speed chases. It wasn't until I moved here that I realized not everyone has that kind of mentality. For some of us, it might be more of a game of tag. Uh, we probably more remember tag as, as a touch and go game that we played as kids. But during this COVID-19 time, I got to tell you, one of the first memories I had of being stay at home order was going outside and playing tag with my boys. <laughs> it was probably the hardest exercise I've had in a very long time. It's pretty humbling when your kids can run faster than you. I also remember pursuing that certain girl. In fact, there's certain things us men will be willing to do in the pursuit of trying to get closer to a young lady. In fact, I remember there were times Alicia would say, hey, I'm going to the library and it'd be like, oh, library, that's where I'm headed too. <laughs> Even though I never went to the library. And of course, I certainly didn't go to the third floor where it was quiet and people were actually studying. <laughs> but I would sit there on the third floor quietly, sitting next to Alicia, trying to study. But instead, all I could think about is how do I hang out with her more. You see, pursuit is this weird kind of thing. It could have a very forceful attitude. It could have a very playful attitude. It could have a very manipulative <laughs> attitude. But the thing is, is that scripture makes it very clear that pursuit is very strong within the covenantal journey that God has for us. But it's a pursuit that is, has different rules. It's one that isn't about manipulation. It isn't about forcefulness, and it isn't even necessarily about playfulness. It's got these whole different planes. In fact, it's not even playing the same game as every other pursuit. That there's counterintuitiveness to the things that we do when we look think about what it's pursuing somebody or pursuing one another. You see, God calls us not only to be pursued by him, that he calls us by name, but he also calls you and I to Pursue one another, that we are to engage in relationship with one another in such a way that we become the light unto the world, that we become the chosen people, that the rest of the world looks at us and goes, there is something about them. And it's how we pursue each other where it begins for us to be the light upon the hill for all to see. So when we take this journey for pursuit, we're going to see that there's a special recipe to the things of what pursuit looks like. And we're gonna take some of the, that from the scriptures of Luke 14 through 15 in the parables that Jesus teaches. We have that of the great banquet or the feast, or we have the lost coin or the lost sheep. And most of all, that you have that story of the lost son, that prodigal son who comes back and a father who runs to him, actively waits for him. You see, these rules of pursuit that God teaches us in these parables are very different, very much counterintuitive to what our world teaches. And my hope is, is that in this journey, we can be a people who begin to pursue one another just as we recognize God has pursued us. That re our scripture today comes from 1 Peter 4. We're going to draw from a number of other things which we will have listed out for you. But there's something special that goes on here. I think this lays down the foundation for us as a people to be able to hear what God wants us to be, what it means for us to be receptive to the things that God wants us to do to pursue each other. Because let's face it, we can proclaim all day. We can move our lips all day. But the thing is, is that until there's something that moves into action, I'm not sure how much fruit comes of it. Even First John says, let us not be just of word, but also of deed. That we know what love is, is when a friend gives his life 
for another. So let us be a people who take a look at this, take a look at the scripture, and deeply consider how it affects who we are. Listen to the word. This is 1 Peter 4, 7 through 19. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 19. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Our scripture today starts with this weird phrase, one that we say too often in our own day, the end of all things is near. I think it's kind of interesting that the solidarity that has lasted over the decades and the generations, that the end times has been happening since Jesus ascended into heaven, that the disciples themselves, the apostles were also in the end times. This is not a debate about uh, revelation or anything like that. I, what I want you to see is that they have gone through tough times. They have gone through persecution. They have gone through a number of ways in which the world has challenged them with its brokenness, chaos, and pulling apart the ways in which life should be. That life is not the way it should be and certainly isn't the way that God had taught them. That Jesus walked with them and told them the kingdom is like and yet they experience something completely different. But Peter goes into something that says, therefore be alert and sober mind so that you may pray. Have you ever thought about that? that? There's a certain posture, a certain attitude that's required for us to pray properly. And that's for us to see that what we are is we are really nothing and precious at the same time. In other words, when we look at ourselves without grace, we simply are the people who need a savior. That we are all fallen short of the glory of God. And when we don't recognize that, we are not in a place to pray. We, we forget what it was like to pray for the one who needed Christ. That it wasn't about us being truth holders. It wasn't about us proclaiming. It was for us to have solidarity with one another. And when we forget that, when we forget that we are nothing and precious at the same time, we become to the people who are now trying to be the savior of the world, the one that tries to bring it all together. See, I have a friend who talked about the first experience of holding his daughter for the first time. He says, I've never loved something so much that I did that moment. And the funny thing is, is that that baby really offers nothing to him other than a poopy diaper, and a sleepless night. And yet, he said, I would do anything for that child. It is precious and nothing at the same time. And, and in many ways, we are that for God. And we have to be reminded in sober judgment, sober mind, and be alert of who we are, that when it comes down to it, we are still so heavily reliant on the advocacy of Christ that we need a touch of his spirit and the grace that is offered to us. 
Because when we become the people who are least of these, we can now pray for the least of these. Not out of a need of being their savior, but to be a people who now have solidarity with them, that we recognize and identify with their need. You see, it says that we need to love deeply, that we become the people who bear grace, and not just to bear it to hold close to ourselves, but to give to each other. That to love deeply means something. You see, First Peter says, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. In fact, Romans, Paul even makes it even uh, a similar semblance of statement that says, love, let your love be sincere and try to outdo one another in hospitality, which I kind of like. That there's becomes this contest of, I can be more hospitable to you than you can be to me. But bottom line, it it is just simply us recognizing that we bear grace so we can bear grace to others. That when we are faced with the people of least of these, it's not about us being the savior to pull them out. but simply a people who can love them and be hospitable and recognize that we are just as valued and precious as they are. And this is how you do it. It says, each, should, each of you should, whatever gift you have received, this is verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. <laughs> anyone who speaks should do as one who speaks the very words of God. Now let's recognize that we just become a stewards of God's grace. We begin to be a people who pour it out to others. This is not for us to be who, people who speak out in such a way that we are going to show you the way. Our approach should be of gentleness with one another. In fact, earlier in 1 Peter, it says, to anyone who asks, give them an answer. It doesn't say give them an answer, even if they're like, there's not a forcefulness. This is not a high-speed chase pursuit. But what it is, is when we pursue one another, we are God's grace, stewards that give and offer what God has for them to share how he's changed me and how he can change you. And when we speak, it's not so much an attitude of truth, but it's an attitude of the Spirit of God that lives in Christ and in his example in Christ. So often we have something to say. And certainly we do. We have the light unto the world. We have the way, the truth, and the life. We should proclaim. But there is something to say that when Scripture says, be slow to speak, and quick to listen. Can I ask you, have we as the church maybe stopped listening? I mean, have we shut our ears down to the rest of the world? Have we shut our ears down to one another? I mean, we're in a weird, divisive time. As pastor, I, I am struggling to figure out how to hold this whole thing together. Part of this is for me to recognize that it's not me that holds it together, it's Christ. But can I call us to be a people who listen? Stop being people of a bullhorn and begin to listen to others. We cannot be a people who are just about posting Facebook of what we think and what we feel. But that we've got to be a people who begin to listen to one another. That we begin to build a bridge rather than a wall between one another. You see, us being the light unto the world, for us to be the light upon the hill for the rest of the world, requires us to pursue each other in such a way. And if we're both talking, if all of us are talking at once, none of us are listening. None of us are trying to identify the true thing that somebody's trying to share. I mean, think about it. How many of us have not recognized that what we share often has a deeper value to it? 
I have a tough time because some of the divisive things that are happening in our world today, I see hurt and pain. I see something that needs healing, not just in a systemic value, but for my brothers and sisters. That God wants to be a people who unites and, and yet there's these gushing wounds. And if we're just willing to give ear of them, just willing to say, I see you, I hear you. Brother, sister, I walk in solidarity with you. She comes to us, to the other value of what it means for us to be ready to pursue each other, to pursue one another. Is that we have to recognize it's going to cost us something. That there's a cost value to the way we pursue. For Jesus, he shows it completely. The fact that he cost everything to him. As he laid down his, his godhood and emptied himself. He became like a man, a servant, even unto death, death on a cross. And in Luke 14, as we see in between the parables, he has this thing where Jesus begins to talk about the cost of discipleship. He says, listen, if any of you want to follow me, you need to pick up your cross daily. This is a call to death. To follow Jesus. He says, listen, nobody goes and builds without first looking at the cost. Nobody goes into war. No king goes to war without discerning what the cost is going to be. And so Jesus himself almost calls his disciples to say, Listen, there's a cost to this. And for you to be wise, you need to understand it may cost you more than you want to give. Jesus paid it all for us. But he also asks us to cost something as well. And that is completely counterintuitive to us. That when we bear God's name, that we are a people who are essentially to give of ourselves lay down our rights. (laughs) Can I tell you? Can I share that I, I get frustrated when we proclaim this thing about Jesus laying down all his rights for us, abandoning everything that he as God himself is so that we can live. And yet we spend so much time So much energy fighting for our own rights. You see, a sober mind looks at us and says, God, I'm not worthy. Can we be a people who begin to stop fighting so much for our own rights and begin to be a people who fight for those who need a voice, who need a support? Can we be a people who are willing to do what we don't want to do in these COVID restrictions for the sake of somebody else? How many people am I willing as pastor to going to sacrifice for the sake of our gathering? How many people am I going to, to take risk at? I'm just saying, I, I, I know I'm getting on a little bit of a soapbox, but can you sense the frustration that I have here? That we are so divided, that we are so much about what we want, that we forget to see that what God is asking us to do is to lay that down just like he did on the cross. That for my brother and sister to live, I sometimes have to lay down my preferences so that their needs become primary. There's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to pursuit. This is more than us just having God who saved us. It is about us taking on the same attitude as he. You see, our freedom says something. It says this, look at this in 419. It says, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. (laughs) That we should, we should be people who participate in the sufferings of Christ. In some ways, being a Christian, you kind of have to be a glutton for punishment, I guess you would say. 
In 1 Peter 2.15, it says, For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, or some say as a cloak for malice, or some would even say to cover up what is malignant, what is cancerous. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. I, I, can we just talk a little bit about that just for a moment? Have you ever felt like you were caught up in the ignorance? <laughs> I think if, if for me, I've spent a little bit of time on Facebook and sometimes I feel like there's a bit of ignorant talk that there's a little bit of us just sharing stuff that we hear. Can I just encourage us? Can I just encourage us to, to maybe step away and see that there's a better way? That we don't just be a people who post stuff, but that we begin to find ways to do good. Because remember, 2.15 in 1 Peter, it says, For it is God's will that, you, that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. If you want to change the world, if you're frustrated with something in Facebook, the best way is to start doing good within the will of God. The other night, I was doing my usual going through the Facebook. I began to be so heavily overwhelmed just not knowing what to do, feeling like the needs of our people and the people around us were so vast and so far beyond my reach, I did not know what to do. I became frustrated. I began to worry and wonder, how do I help the people? How do I help the one who's losing their job? How do I help the one who desperately believes in this or the person who believes in that? got to the place where I put my phone down or I closed the app of Facebook and I just decided to start calling people. And I began to call the people of our church. And I began to say, how are you? What are you up to? So what have you been doing this week? Can I tell you that I love you? Can I tell you that I appreciate you? Listen, th this is not about me. This is about me saying that I recognize that what sometimes when there's not a solution, it's finding something to do that makes us do good so that we can silence the ignorant talk of foolish people so that we don't buy into the ram -a ram I don't even know what ram -a ram is, it, but that the, <laughs> the, the craziness, the, the, the diverse opinions and views. And I began to recognize sometimes just calling somebody and saying, how are you? To remember that there are people who are still sick. That I didn't lose sight of who our people were. That they were beyond what they posted. It, there's something also here that says that do not let your freedom as a cover-up for evil, or as it also says, do not let it be cloaked in malice. Don't let it be malignant, something that is cancerous inside. Isn't it funny how we use our freedom sometimes? We take the freedoms we have and it creates this cancer, this thing that begins to tear us apart, becomes destructive into who we are. Are we filled with malice? Have we tried to repress it down? Have we tried to say, it's okay, I believe in God and I love one another, but yet somehow we have this repression of frustration and don't understand why. And we become overwhelmed and hopeless. Are you a person who is here today listening to this and you feel the frustration and the breaking of your heart and you don't know why. And that we begin, when we begin to do that and hold that in, we think we can press it down. And as it bubbles up, what we do is we stop listening and we assume things off a lens of malignancy. 
that what we do is we avoid the things that bubble that malice up. That, that we stop looking at the post or calling the person that we are frustrated most with. And we close our eyes to that and we think that somehow solves it. And yet the malice and the cancer begins to eat away at us. And it begins to divide us as a people and we stop pursuing one another. And we stop being a people who write one another off. Remember, we are a people as stewards of God's grace. That we bear a grace that God is saying, offer it to one another. Share it with one another. Stop dividing yourselves and begin to build a bridge that show that God's people is something that is unlike any other, that aren't playing by the same pursuit rules as the rest of the world. That we don't have to be fully in line with everyone's political views in order to be brother and sister. That we are the stewards of God's grace in various forms. Before we move on, can I just say, if you're a person who is, identifies with that, that bubbling, that frustration, that malice, that, that you sense there's something malignant in your heart, not that you hate them, but that you have avoided them, that you have divided yourself from them, that you've cut them off emotionally, that no longer can you see them as a whole person, but only by what they have posted And I ask you just to take the moment. Just take a moment now. Don't wait. But now take a moment and ask God. Ask God to take it from you. Allow God to be the one who supersedes that and fills your heart with grace. That you're reminded that you are a bearer of that grace. And that you don't have to repress it, but you are to be a person who begins to be forgiven for it. And that today, now, that when you hand that malice over to God, God can fill you back up with his grace to be gracious to the people around you today. Let there be something supernatural that happens now that stops dividing you from the rest of the people you love. We need to live as free We need to know that freedom doesn't play by the same rules. In fact, when we live as free, we don't even just play by different rules, but we play for a different type of reward. Think about it. The rest of the world, it's about either selfish gain, selfish ambition, greed, its own pleasure, status, we, as God's people, no longer pursue those things. But what we pursue is to see Christ glorified. It says that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. What we see is when God was glorified, that in Philippians 2, that when Jesus made himself nothing and became a servant unto death, death on the cross, what happens there is there he's exalted at the right hand of the Father. And there is where every knee and tongue will confess that he is Lord. That in his pursuit, that in his surrender to all, their glorification happens. And if we today become a people who say, yes, I want to pursue one another, that I recognize that I am nothing without God, would you be a person who recognizes that when you surrender, it's not that we will have jewels ourselves, but we begin to see Christ be glorified. 
And yet, here's the weird thing about this, is that when Christ is glorified, we're blessed. When I surrender, God gives. And this is not a prosperity gospel type blessing, but what I am saying that I have lived life to the fullest by seeing how when I surrender, God is glorified. And out of that becomes blessing, new life, and fruitfulness. So when I surrender, to him be glorified, not I. In closing, this is not a Father's Day message by any means. But as I think about my boys, as I think about what it means to be a father, there's something about when I became a father that I recognized that I knew nothing about how to be a good dad. Other than all I wanted to do was be exactly that. Through the years that I've been a dad, I've been full of blessing. But it's not because I had anything special to offer. But I learned the trick of what being a good dad may be, and at the heart of it is surrender. That when I surrender to my my needs, my wants, for the sake of my boys, I become a good father. When I surrender my need to yell and scream at them because they are frustrating me and that they've been fighting me and not obeying me. When I surrender that and begin to listen to my boys, I become a good father. When I begin to surrender, I become a good father. Just like Paul, it's not that I have obtained it, but I forget what is behind and I press towards for what is before me, the prize that Christ has set before me. On this day, can we see amidst the malice that grows in our hearts, the ignorance that happens in social media and other platforms, the frustration and the divide that the world wants us to do, can we be a people who proclaim that we are to pursue one another, that we are to love one another deeply, that in that deep love, we will suffer and participate in the sufferings of Christ simply so that our others can live, that we are unified with our pain, that when I hear the deeper values of what somebody is saying, I am listening not just what they are saying, but what they are feeling and hearing. To so that has value. Can we be a people who commit today to pursue one another so that when the world looks around, when the brokenness is in chaos, May we not be swayed by the media or what is hot in the moment, but may we create a culture in such a way that we love deeply, we surrender to one another, that we live freely, not so that we can have our rights, but so that we can freely give of ourselves, just as Christ has freely given to us. Let us lay down what we consider our wants and begin to look to the needs of our loved ones. Those loved ones are simply the least of these. Not just the people I get along with. Not just the, the ones that look like me. Not just the ones that sound like me. The ones that are least like me. Just as Jesus did with the 12. He picked the people that were least like him. Yet out of that, he changed the world. you begin to see that hope and change starts at the attitude that we are to pursue one another in such a way that Christ is glorified. Would you pray with me? 
God, I pray that you would just be with us. And as we begin this journey, that although this is a very rough, hard reality to start with, but as we begin to look at the recipe of what it means for us to pursue, what it looks like for us to pursue others and one another, may we take personal inventory now. May we be people who are free not so that we can have our rights, but so that we can surrender them back to you. That we would be people who begin to do good. That we would find the simple actions that will, will deafen and mute the ignorance around our world. God, may we be a people who begin to value one another. That amidst our different views, we have solidarity in our pain. And in that pain, God, your grace is sufficient for all. So God, I pray for anybody who is hurting today. I pray for anybody who is in pain. I pray for anybody who has let the malignancy set deep in their heart. Would you release them of that? Would you grant them peace? Will you allow them to see that you have hope and that the changing of the world lies within our community? And that just as you have pursued us, God, us today as a church, even though we meet in separate rooms, in separate buildings, in separate homes, may we be people today who declare that I will pursue my brother. I will pursue my sister, regardless of what it is that is intuitive to me. That I will humble myself in such a way that you, God, would be glorified. That you would be glorified when I surrender all. So God, do what you will. Help us, God, to see the power of pursuit. Let us be reminded of what you pursued in us. Which was nothing and precious at the same time. So God... Help us as, G, as, as a church that to be unified even in the moments in which we have been separated, the ways in which we have been divided. Unify us, God, back simply because you are Lord. So therefore we pray this, that you would be glorified. And I pray this in the name of Christ, the one who was and is, and will always be, Christ be glorified. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to teach us a new song that when we sing it, there might be particular people or groups of people that come to your mind. Um, the words of this song are, when I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother. And I know right now, and I'm just going to name it for what it is. There's a lot of rhetoric and discussion and divisiveness and tension around the Black Lives Matter movement, around the ways that law enforcement are being treated um, very unlovingly right now. And there's a lot of us in this community who have very strong feelings and are directly affected by what's happening. And we're frustrated and we're annoyed and there's lots of us that don't feel heard right now. The reason why I bring that up in connection to this song is because when we say the word enemy and brother, we don't want to put the same person in both of those categories. But the thing is, is that we are Christians and that God has taught us that even the person that we see or perceive as our enemy is our brother. And I've seen a lot of you share on social media and share pain and lament and frustration against a particular group of people, whether that's police or protesters or looters or fill in the blank. And the thing is, is that no matter who you're perceiving to be your enemy right now, we're still commanded by God to love them. 
And that's so hard. But I encourage you that if this if this song is too much or maybe you're angry about the way that I'm talking about this right now, feel your anger. Identify why you're feeling angry. And let's talk about it. The more that we process things on our own without conversation, without connecting with one another about why we feel hurt or unheard or not seen by each other, the more divided we become. And so as as I teach you this song, if you're frustrated, I see you. If you're excited, I see you. If you're weeping, I see you. And when I say I see you, I would hope that you would know that the church sees you and that we may not all agree on the ways on how to proceed forward socially and politically, but I think we can agree that when we put all of that aside to put our identity in how God wants us to live, we know that it is together. And we know that it means looking at our enemy and saying, I still love you. And let's work on that together. Okay? So the song, again, the word is, words are, when I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother. So we'll sing it a couple times together. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother. I see my brother. When I look into the face of my enemy, I see my brother I see my brother let's sing that again together when I look into the face of my enemy I see my brother I see my brother when I look into the face of my enemy I see my brother I see my brother forgive this is the garment of our courage the power to make the peace we long to know and open up our eyes to see the wounds that bind all of humankind and may your shadow charity and love when I look into the face of my enemy I see my brother I see my brother when I look into the face of my enemy I see my brother I see my brother Lord may we be malleable to the point where you can help us see our enemy as our brother we ask this in your name amen Thank you for joining us at Starting Grounds Church. We are glad to have you. 
If you're interested in, in our email list, please sign up through emailing startinggroundschurch at gmail.com. You can also find us at www.startinggroundschurch.com. You can also join us on our Facebook groups and our Zoom groups. If you're interested in supporting Starting Grounds Church, it is as easy as texting 84321 and entering the amount, which will send you over to a secure site. We hope that God has blessed you and that he continues to do that as you seek him.